course, like any self-respecting leader, we do have uh, exciting guest speakers for you as well. Uh, so, so for tonight, the guest speaker tonight is going to, uh, he was uh, a senior executive at the Gun Group, if you all know the Gun Group, and he's now managing principal at Agile IT, so clearly in this practice, and NAI. Um, he has advised, you know, senior executives both in IT and in the business on, you know, the, the uh, on lean and agile development, most of all industry. So tonight, I, I'm not going to steal the thunder here. Uh, tonight, the topic is how to translate business strategies and, and, and business objectives into the uh, lean and agile transformation that to deliver to those goals. Uh, and he will share the technique and experience. Um, so please uh, welcome Amit Lori. Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, let me start off by just a little bit of the intro uh, about myself. Uh, as Hong mentioned, I've uh, been in the consulting side of things for about uh, 20 years or so. And before that, uh, I was uh, at Countrywide for about five years as the head of IT in the area of data center management, infrastructure support, the development of distributed systems, and software development in the early 1980s. Uh, so I've been around a number of different industries, especially since I became a consultant about 20 years ago. Uh, I actually joined Gartner uh, to run their consulting practice uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, I started as the lead of their technical architecture practice, and from there, uh, we built a number of practices back in those days. The ERP was a big thing to be able to put in new standardized systems to run your back office. Uh, and then eventually Y2K came about. That was a big deal for a long time uh, during the latter parts of the, de uh, the century. And then for the last uh, 18 years or so, a variety of projects. Uh, and that has what led me to now specialize in the areas of lean and agile. Uh, as you heard from uh, Ang, uh, this has become a very, very timely and of high interest topic for many organizations, especially as the rate of competition and the pace of competition has increased with every industry. Uh, you could get competitors coming into your industry anytime without you know, any kind of notice. You know, people are now worried about, will Amazon be in my business if I'm distributing pharmacy, as an example? Or, uh, will I be buying my food from Amazon? Or uh, how will I actually share my uh, uh, mother-in-law <laughs> unit that I have using uh, Airbnb? All kinds of concepts are emerging and disrupting many industries. Uh, so for a lot of the clients that I've been working with, is the concept really has converged around how do I use Agile, how do I use lean startup concepts, and how do I use the methods that have been proven in the past in how strategy should be developed to better form my strategies and better be able to uh, approach the market. So that's basically the focus for uh, my practice for the last uh, five to seven years, is to develop methodologies that can actually help organizations achieve that. Uh, this actually has led to uh, a process by which we actually combine strategic planning for business with the concepts of uh, business performance improvement through lean methodologies. Uh, and also combining it with agile and scaled agile methods to be able to build systems. Because these days you can't really do much in business unless you're able to bring new products and solutions that are providing better ways of reaching out through different channels to your customer base. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you. There's a lot of content here, but I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to interact. So I think questions are the best way to make sure that I'm focused on the concepts that you want to hear about. Uh, all of this is available via a link. This is a presentation, it's about 50 pages, so it's a lot of content. A lot of it I'll just spend a few seconds on, 30 seconds or so, just to tell you why it's here and how it's relevant to our discussion. But I'd like to make sure that you chime in with questions. I think interactive discussion is probably the best way to talk about the things that you care the most about. We'll have a chance to talk about what is, what is the relationship between lean and agile, basic stuff and how is Agile different than scaled Agile, and what are the players, what are the acronyms, the things that you want to hear, because I realize not everybody has had many years of Agile uh, coming into the session, for some of these brand new concepts, for others who've been doing it for a while, 
they want to go to the next level of advancement in that topic or bring new capabilities to the organization uh, today is a challenge for them. Uh, so I'm happy to stop the topic and make sure it's focused on the things that you want to hear about. So please do feel free to chime in or stop me whenever you feel appropriate. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you'd like to take notes, there's page numbers on these. So if there's something in here that you want to ask about, I'm available via email. You can always send me a quick note. Or if you want to write down a question that intrigued you, so just take down the page number as we get to that topic, write it to yourself a note, and then when you download the, the PDF, you'll be able to see the actual page and then come back to me or any of our uh, folks here at Meetup, and then if you have a question, we can uh, uh, converse about it on email or other means appropriate. So let me get started. Uh, so this is about the Lean Agile uh, Meetup itself. You already know about this. You have mentioned it to you, so I won't spend any more time on it. I'm very excited to be a part of this. I'm the second speaker, I think, for your second meetup. I'm looking forward to the future sessions uh, that will be held here and uh, hopefully be able to contribute further uh, to uh, the topics that are of interest to this group. Uh, this is our agenda. We have, as you can see here, about an hour allocated to this discussion. Uh, but I understand that we want to keep it interactive. So if you have questions where we have to veer off and have a five minute uh, slide discussion about anything, uh, we'll go a little bit beyond 8 o'clock. Uh, the intent is to make sure you have enough time to also interact and talk about questions, problems, and topics that are of interest to you. So if you have a, a whole 25 or 30 minutes dedicated to making sure that you have an opportunity to talk to folks who you want to hear about and talk about the specific topics. So that's our agenda. We'll go to finish around 9. I understand that those close at 9.30. So probably between that 9 and 9.30. Uh, we'll have to wrap up uh, the process here. Okay, so what are we going to do in today's session? As I mentioned, what you're going to hear about is the highest level view of why this topic matters. And what we start with is business strategy. How do I think about it? How do I debate? How do I develop new ways of competing differently in my specific industry? How do I analyze the impact of digital technologies? How do I understand what can have a high impact in my specific business? So we'll start with that conversation. How do we actually start to put this on paper, and how do we have quick discussions about it rather than six months to a year strategic planning process? What we find is organizations no longer have the patience or the energy or the time to spend six months to a year to create a 300-page plan. Those days are far gone. What they really want is to have a 15-minute conversation about what if Microsoft did this, or Amazon did that, or Google did this, and what is the impact, and how do I take advantage of this new technology? How will artificial intelligence change how I interact with this portion of my customers? Those are the kind of topics they want to talk about, and they want to do it quick. Nobody has six months to analyze, or dive, dive, dive deeper into the cost of the, the cost structure of the company. Very, very hard to do. So we want to talk about how do you do that very quickly and how do you visualize the information so anybody can participate and quickly get to the points that are important. Which means we're going to have subject matter experts that will interact in maybe an hour or two and come up with strategic plans that can be experimented with. There is no longer that two-year or five-year plan. That those days are long gone. We have to learn to experiment. Whether you're Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, Amazon, or GM, you have to find ways to quickly have these discussions and be able to come up with experiments that let you prove something and do something with it or set it aside. It's called pivot, is our terminology. We'll also talk about another concept that you may have heard about or are interested in is the concept of value stream mapping. This is a concept that has been popularized with the trends that you saw in the 80s and 90s around quality management or total quality management or wall bridge work. These concepts lay the foundation for what is referred to as the lean methodologies as a way to improve its performance. Value stream mapping is one of those tools in the tool bag of the lean consultant to be able to understand what the business does and how exactly it performs. Very difficult to do. How do I know I'm making money if I'm McKesson? or uh, GM, what are my value streams? Who benefits from it? What is my cost structure? How is it different than my competitor? How will Google change the way I compete in my industry? How do I understand and analyze that? 
So live stream mapping is a way for us to have those discussions. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that is and how it can help inform our discussions around how to do something in my business to help achieve a certain outcome that I have in mind. And finally, linking all of this to your specific Agile projects. For many of you, it may be you just heard about an Agile project that's going on someplace with a small team, with six or ten people, who is really happy and getting a lot of acknowledgement. But the company has already experimented two or three times to try to make it four teams or five teams, and it just craters and falls apart. <clears throat> Scaling Agile is one of the key challenges. If you were doing Agile, that's a combination. Yeah, Agile is great with that small team and that unique personality, but not for the bigger project, for the bigger portfolio. He doesn't work, he doesn't scale. So one of the key topics that's emerged is how do we scale these agile methods? How can we do that if you have 5,000 people in IT? What if you have 50 development teams? What if you're trying to create the next big hardware project that would attend something to move? How do I do that? How do I take advantage of agile methodologies? Well, scaled agile methods are trying to go after that problem. There are several out there. Uh, and there's several methodologies for promoting it. One of the most uh, popular one that you'll hear more and more about is something called Scaled Agile Framework, SAFE, uh, for short, SAFE. Uh, actually, Hong actually has a course at UC Santa Cruz that talks about that uh, and teaches folks and what SAFE is all about. In essence, that comes from Dean Leffingwell, uh, who is, again, a long-time software engineer, software developer, who has been around methodologies for about 40 years or so, and he was looking for ways to improve upon the scalability of agile methods. And he, in essence, started to combine several methodologies such as Scrum, such as XP, and Lean into a more scalable architecture. The methodology is free. You can actually go on, on the web and you can find it very easily, the scaledagileframework.com. All the content is free. And the way the organization is actually able to make money off of that is by certifying individuals who are interested in it, and in essence, getting the sponsors who are interested in doing consulting or becoming agile coaches or trainers on the content. Very popular, they're probably twice as popular as other methodologies today, like LESS or Nexus or Spotify, there's a few other ones out there. Many of them try to take the working concepts of agile and try to make it work at higher scale with higher number of teams. That's the basic concept. <clears throat> so those are the three topics we're going to spend time on. Please go ahead. Can you write down one for the other? Uh, actually, it's in here. I'll point them out to you. Actually, there's a comparison. There's a lot of detail in here. Hopefully, uh, you like the content that I have for you here. There's, uh, there's both the name as well as comparison of those methodologies. So you'll, you'll have it in your uh, download. Thank you. All right, so that's a little bit about me. As I mentioned, about 35 plus years. Uh, the last 20 in consulting different industries. Uh, right now, I'm engaged uh, with the largest healthcare private healthcare provider in Portugal. We are doing completely their, their new digital strategy using third generation electronic health record systems combined with emerging technology around remote monitoring, artificial intelligence, uh, and new practices uh, around uh, medicine. So, those are the kind of projects that I usually support for clients. Uh, and I get to practice some of the things that I'm showing with you today with clients by using the methods to develop the content and the specific actions coming out of it. Uh, I also have been around IT for a while, so I've been doing ISO and ISO service management and ISO 20,000 to the infrastructure side of things back in the 2000s. Uh, that was the time when service management was very popular having incident and change management problems, basic architectures to be able to run IT professionally. Uh, so those things were my focus in the last decade, and I'm also a CISSP, so I've been around security issues for a long time uh, as far as focus and specialization. All right, so discussion agenda, I'm going to talk about how to start with business strategy and how do you actually link yourself if you're a project manager or working on an agile project. How do you link yourself back to what's going on at the business level so that the CEO cares about what you're doing and how they're connected? This is a common issue in every organization we work with. Being able to tie it to a specific metrics. Why should you care? Why should a CEO or CEO care about a project that you're working on? Or if you're participating in deciding what that project is, what do you do to measure your success and your contribution to the business performance? So we'll talk a little bit about the metrics. Then we'll talk about 
what is the latest trend in terms of digital technologies? Artificial intelligence, blockchain, conversational uh, interfaces. These are all things that everybody is trying to figure out how it applies to their business. How do we evaluate those things? And then, of course, value stream mapping, how to measure things, uh, how to connect that to your specific uh, projects within uh, your IT or software development business, and then, of course, critical success factors. All right, so starting from the top, why is this relevant? Pace of change has changed. I've been working with a lot of clients that used to do three-year plans, five-year plans, and in the last five years, those who kept doing it, they ended up completely putting it aside in the last three years. What happened was the drivers completely changed. Competitors completely changed. You have to get into a mode of being able to continuously evaluate and update your strategies. You cannot do those two to four to five year plans any longer. And for everybody, that means you have to figure out a way to think and innovate faster, create new value with existing uh, clients and existing dimensions, uh, be able to embrace experimentation. How do I know blockchain will work in this function? How do I know I can apply artificial intelligence to improve this service to a client? Well, the only way is to experiment. And there's principles within these methodologies that help you with that process. Also, you want to be able to transform from the traditional legacy silos of function or function orientations, finance and marketing and operations, logistics, trying to figure out to work together to focus on holistic experiences for your customers, for your employees, and for your partners. Then you build systems. The customer journeys have become the most important point of view. Rather than how do I optimize between two functions that are side of the function in the business. So being able to look at these drivers in your industry and then look at how exactly this has to bring new capability to bear. Being able to mass personalize and customize to audience of one. I can no longer do mass uh, uh, production of anything. I have to be able to customize to individual clients, partners, and stakeholders. How do I do local adaptations if I'm operating in five countries? How do I make sure that it's a concept that makes sense if I'm Uber, and I want to take Uber to Mexico, Uber to South Africa, how do I tailor and be able to do that in my industry? And of course, the legacy IT issues have not changed. IT still struggles to show value. IT still doesn't know how to connect and develop requirements with the business. And they don't know how to show value to the CEO. Those issues are still with us, haven't gone away. And almost every organization that you go to, they say, you spend so much money in IT, you don't know what to get. <laughs> it's almost a common theme in every organization. So can digital transformation help? The answer is yes, that's why many organizations are going in this direction. Common challenges, why agility is needed in this kind of transformation, because more and more of the projects are this kind of a profile. The requirements are not well understood. I don't know how blockchain is going to help me. <laughs> All I can tell you is that there is maybe a concept that's useful to me. I have to figure out how to start to experiment. So we don't know much about requirements. We just know that it may help us. Many times we overbuild in terms of features. The averages are that more than 50% of the projects have kind of functionality that is not used by any of its users. Imagine your Microsoft Office or Excel. How much of the Excel functionality most of us use? At best, 15%, maybe 20%. 80% of that goes unused. That's why companies like Google can have Google Sheets with 20% of the functionality and still be able to deliver the same little bit of build. So we overbuild and build too many features into our products. Projections and being able to actually do estimates is very, very difficult. This is called the cone of uncertainty. When we first start a project, we know the least amount about that project. But most management wants to know the exact dollar amount when you start. Tell me between 17 million and 18 million, right? Well, what do we do? We just pat it and say, well, maybe 25, and if I do better, you know, maybe I got lucky. The point is that it's very difficult to accurately do any kind of estimates. So traditional methods do not really work well, especially when it comes to estimation, especially because they require an estimate and a business case in advance. Guess what? So, 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 so,
on the free vector that they are given. Ecosystem. So think about how a Microsoft ecosystem competes with an Apple ecosystem, competes with a Google ecosystem. So when you're talking about the biggest players that we were just talking about here, it's all about ecosystem. So Google has been taking 10 to 20 percent of their profits and building all of this free stuff. Of course, they started to charge you for it. Now it's used to eat. Now you pay 25 bucks for the user and all that. But for many, many years, you could get the Google Office at no cost. You could get many functionalities from Google, from email to you know, XYZ, all at no cost. Why they want to do that is because they want you to participate in their ecosystem compared to the Microsoft ecosystem, compared to the Apple ecosystem. And of course, if they can, they want to monetize it. But remember that the reason they can do that is because they're number one in terms of ads. Targeted. It was, it was the only game in town until Facebook showed up with a viable model. <laughs> So Google used advertising as a way to subsidize that ecosystem. But once they got enough users through universities and other places, they're now charging you for it. Many organizations have started to migrate to it because it's less expensive, but then you lose something. The question is, is that important to you if you lose something or not? Still, we have 85% that use Microsoft Office because they want to have all kinds of remote functionality or disconnect functionality as well as the richness that it offers for other things they wanted. That's a long discussion by itself, but ecosystem is the main answer to that question. Uh, so again, changing the paradigm is very important because our projects today are no longer predictable, and traditional methods and traditional PMI approaches are not always going to work for us. Yes, Chris. I just want to go on a requirement. Please. Understood. That's not always a failing uh, effort or anything. Sometimes the requirements are not understandable because the market's changing too fast, competitors are yep. come on the horizon, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, requirements not defined or definable. Exactly. It's actually more of the latter, I would argue, to your point. It's not definable. It's not that I did a poor job of understanding what you wanted. You didn't know what you wanted. You wouldn't even know until you see it in action. <laughs> It'd be a year from now. And I had an idea last year, but now your requirements have moved. Exactly, exactly. So yes, absolutely. These are the reasons why traditional methods tend to be challenged. Because of the world, pace of change and how the world is changing around us. So a methodology that we usually try to advocate as we talk to clients about these kind of issues and challenges is the ability to connect these things together so that when the CEO asks, why am I investing $150 million on this project? Or why are you asking for 50 more people in this function? There's a rationale to that discussion. And there's a direct line between the investments you're making in IT and the projects back to the specific business reasons and the competitive strategies that you have. So that's basically the goal of this process. So the business and digital the transformation strategy defines the focus that we have to have around the processes and the people that need to be there to be able to transform the business, supported by your IT and lean projects or business. So it starts with documenting, understanding your model, uh, business model canvas, then supporting it with specific digital transmission opportunities that have a meaning to your business and your competitive line strategy, then translating that into the specific value streams that create value for segments of your customer base. Being able to show those linkages and show how you will get value from that and how you will measure it is the key to success. And that's basically what I'm going to try to share with you in example and illustrations in this discussion. Okay, so these are the strategic questions. If you're trying to develop the strategic plan for organization, you usually have to ask these questions. Who's the competition? Uh, what's the value proposition? Why do people buy from us? How many different customer segments do I have? How is that customer segment changing? How is their behavior? How are their needs evolving and changing? Uh, what is our strength? What can we do to compete better in our specific industry? What can we take advantage of? Something that we do well. Uh, what are the digital opportunities? What can we do differently? Can I use artificial intelligence differently? Can I use uh, the new concepts around uh, conversational interface differently? Maybe that's where I'll trade the life for my specific needs. Uh, how do I get to new markets? Can I take what I have and apply it to a different market or a different segment? How can I take advantage of some of the lean startup concepts around building, measuring, and learning and creating these new business models? These are the kind of questions you want to ask because it helps us define 
what those opportunities are in our business, and then be able to document it. A very common tool these days that you may hear about is called the business model canvas. Uh, a gentleman out of Switzerland actually popularized this in the last five years because it's a very easy way to have a discussion around why and how you compete in your industry. What it does, it takes a business strategy and puts it into nine key building blocks. And what this does for us is allows us to have discussions about specific things. So if I have an opportunity to go online, it's a channel discussion. If I can go to a subscription-based revenue model, it's a revenue discussion. If I can have a, a reduction in cost because of application of uh, blockchain in this contract, it's a cost reduction opportunity, so on and so forth. It allows us to have these key elements all looked at and put together in a very quick diagram, a large piece of paper, and the subject matter experts who know something about my industry can have 15 minute conversations. What if they actually added a subscription model? What if Lyft could actually sell you a $30 a month model of some sort that you gave them because you had the need for a specific type of service? That's an example. Why you, what if you didn't have to just go a mile per or a dollar per mile kind of model? What if you actually could market differently or communicate differently to your customer? You could actually have those discussions depending on what industry you're in, what proportion of your business you're talking about. This is an example of Uber. And you can see how very quickly what they do and what they use. Their primary channel is the Uber app. Obviously, that's how they deliver their service. That's they, how they connect you to a driver. Of course, they communicate with you and they also market to you through other channels, but this is their primary delivery channel. And their customer segments are the drivers and the riders. And then you can actually take each one of these categories and then create sub-segments. Older, uh, disabled people in <laughs> one category, kids needing to go to school in another category, so on and so forth. Each one of those categories then could have different models for revenue stream, for cost structure, for resources it needs, so on and so forth. It is a quick way for us to put all of this in into a wall and have a discussion about it and guess what the impact would be on our business. And then I'm giving you here a specific kind of way that you can measure what the CEO cares about. Depending on your industry, these will be different, but this is an example that happens to be from pharmaceuticals. The key performance indicators for this industry happens to be administrative costs, the amount of inventory, uh, lost sales and service, and their transport and warehousing capabilities. Those are the core metrics for that. Well, if they need to have an idea of how they're performing against those core metrics, and what is an optimal digital performance like? Who's doing it, and how much is possible in my industry? Once I understand through some research those ideas, then I can have a target performance. So what are you doing? You're actually talking about things that matter to how you make money in that business. And you're putting specific targets, and those are specific targets then going to have a specific project associated. That's how we want to be able to articulate and get support for projects. This is other metrics when you're trying to do some kind of a scaled agile deployment, as an example. Uh, when you first start, it takes a long time to get traction. However, if you have a team of 5,000 trying to do stuff, you better have ways of understanding what's going on, who's doing better, who's doing worse. What can I do to help enable certain teams? There's ways that we can actually measure some of those things through a lot of self-assessments and reporting from the projects that are going on every day. This is an example of what an actual business model discussion looks like. You put this little chart on the wall and you start to look at a specific customer segment and come up with ideas that you want to experiment with. After an hour discussion about two, with two or three, four people in the, in the organization who know something about your business and your industry, we have a few ideas here that you can experiment with. This may generate three or four ideas about what you could actually experiment with and see what can actually help you with that strategy. Another key idea is that I want to be able to take advantage of emerging digital technologies. You'll hear about this quite a bit these days. Everybody wants to take advantage of something that's coming. Of course, the most uh, prominent one that you hear about is Bitcoin. Everybody wants to do something with Bitcoin. <laughs> but that's just one instance and one use case of blockchain technology. Technology that can actually be used 
for many different use cases, uh, but today it's all about the currency, uh, virtual currency uh, being the hottest thing. But if there are other things, artificial intelligence. How do I apply machine learning to my business? How do I take advantage of big data analytics, cloud services? If I'm in healthcare, how can I tap the data that is available through Kaiser or Geisinger or Google Health or Microsoft Health Health, whatever? How do I take advantage of that to be able to do a better job uh, being able to serve prepare my patients? How do I take advantage of chatbots to give a better user interface to my clients? Uh, how do I get uh, conversational personal assistance into my model? How do I take advantage of Alexa or any of the Google Home models of uh, operation? Blockchain, cloud to the edge and mobility, platform for service, uh, API economy and microservices, immersive experiences, Internet of Things, robotic cross all of these things could have some application in your industry. So uh, as you're thinking about these opportunities, you need to be able to look at a specific uh, value chains for your business or value streams and see if these technologies could be helpful in that particular area. This is the step three in the journey. And this is the idea of how do I actually take advantage of the concepts of lean. So lean is really about understanding how to remove waste from your business. Okay, that's, that's the focus. How do I remove waste from my business? What that means is that everything that I do has some process associated with it. That process has certain costs and resources associated with it. Being able to map that process and then be able to remove non-value added activities and costs from it could have a huge impact on my business performance. So this is about how do I actually understand my value streams and then take out the cost that is not needed. So imagine having 100,000 thousand transactions some kind and taking 10% out of it because of a change in process. Could have huge impact. Organizations that do this well actually are more successful than others. So we want to be able to get to the point where we can understand and continuously improve our processes. Here's the detailed methods behind that. This is the lean methodology. You start with plotting the main steps on your, how you create value, and I'll show you some examples here in a few minutes. Then you collect data on quality and, and time. These two are the two key factors that actually result in certain cost structures. Things that take 25 days could be reduced to 12 days or two days or two, two hours, depending on what it is, based on optimizing how you look at quality and time metrics. Finding opportunities to improve and innovate in particular process areas. Being able to investigate those areas and then prioritize opportunities around process changes, system changes, structural changes, staffing and resources, and being able to train folks around. That's the methodology that we're going to try to put to use, and that's some of the details that you see on this side. Why is this important? I think we've all experienced, we've experienced organizations who have poor process. We call somebody. Left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Nobody knows what's going on in the organization. Things take excessive amounts of time. Sometimes weeks, sometimes months, and we don't get the response that we need. How does it look from inside? A lot of complexity, lots of exceptions, uh, lots of uh, circumvention of process, lots of information exchange that are redundant, lots of uh, checking and double checking, uh, lots of uh, firefighting, so on and so forth. I'm sure you've all been part of organizations that have these as their core part of how they run their business. And they're trying very hard to keep it together. Being a value-driven uh, organization and focusing on being a lean digital enterprise is all about removing waste. That's really what this is. Removing waste from the processes that you have, non-value added activities. You can use technology to do that, but you can also do it by changing process. You don't always need technology. The companies are uh, following the top down approach. Are they doing the complete enterprise uh, transformation or are they focusing on some department? Uh, some yeah, every, department. every organization is different, so there's not very really expensive, right? Uh, yeah. the transformation. You could have them both. You could, you could actually have companies in, in the case that I was describing to you in Portugal, the board decided that they needed this. So the board said, let's go out and hire a consultant from outside. Take a look at our technology capabilities and develop a new digital strategy. So it was for all of their operations. And there are organizations that are doing it for a specific business unit or a specific experimental business that they want trying to get into. So it could be anywhere. 
But the point is that these are the kind of methods that are most useful in impacting your performance in your organization. For example, many of the global exhibits are very, very, very small, small companies, and they just think every time there is a complex system in this all the time. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, if you're a small company trying to implement a whole new idea, there's not a whole lot of process. The whole process is what we have known. And you're trying to create something that changes some, something for some clients that you have. But if you're a huge company like Jonathan Johnson, there's many lines of business. <laughs> Each line of business is unique. You're competing with different businesses. Uh, how you compete will be different. Your cost structures are different. So basically, whether you do it for this line of business called Colgate Toothpaste, like an example, or how you do things for this huge uh, uh, business of uh, moving something to move, completely different processes, and both may need some kind of strategic help. Uh, so methods that we're talking about here could apply to both. Depends on what the issue is and the project matter experts that we've the discussion. So again, we have lots of content, so I'm kind of running through this very quickly so you can see the concepts. But the idea here is that we want to achieve continuous flow. Small batches and continuous flow. That's what Lean brings to the organization. That is the most optimal way that you can run any process. Continuous flow. What does it do? It reduces lead times, it reduces work in process, reduces wait time, quickly identifies problems and fixes them, reduces handling, so on and so forth. And those, these ideas could be applied to any, any industry. This is an example of pharmaceuticals, from raw material and packaging to the full, the full uh, value chain of the manufacturers, R&D, the warehousing process, and eventually getting to the hospital distributors and pharmacy retail organizations. So that whole retail chain could actually be optimized at any part of this process, and the focus should be for continuous. So what do you mean by value stream? So given you have, now that I've given you all of that, here's the definition for value stream. It's all the activities that an organization performs to transform an internal external customer request into a good or service. So it's whatever your customer wants. A value, a value stream is the processes that you go through from initiation of request to receiving them. In the case of Amazon, it's when you start searching for something, you order something and it eventually is delivered to your door. That whole thing is the life cycle of how you interact with Amazon, as an example. So well, Amazon music is different. Amazon food is different, so on and so forth. Every part of the business will be different. But it's all the activities that we go through from the time that a customer says I want something, to the time that you receive that as the end customer. That's called a value stream. Okay? How do we map it? Very basic concepts. You have a customer on top, then you have processes that you go through, high level processes. So there's a process box that talks about this is what's done in this uh, activity, and here's the number of people involved with that. Then that process is done, goes to the next box, to the next box until the whole thing is done. For each one of these process boxes, you're gonna have a data box. A data box collects information about that process that's important. Things like lead time, things like processing time, things like quality of the data that I need for that particular process to happen. All of this is collected, and then once you understand it, you're looking for optimization opportunities. I'll give you an example. So before I go to the example, actually, these are the typical metrics that I try to capture. The most important ones are lead time and processing. Processing time is the actual work done by an individual. What you find is that the actual work done for many processes is a matter of minutes or hours, but the actual duration could be days. It's 45 days to do something, but the actual work was 100 minutes, as an example. So the actual processing time, the 100 minutes, is called PT. The actual total duration to get to the end of the process is called the lead time or cycle time. Okay. The reason you collect this data is because you know want to know where the opportunities are. You also want to understand how things stood in the queue and wait to be processed. You want to understand how complete and accurate the data is that you need to do the processing. So you never want to give bad data or no data to the next step in the process. And you want to get as much of the quality data upfront as possible. That's the least amount of cost you could incur as an organization. And there's other things. You have IT systems that actually impact how you do things, the demand rate for that process, so on and so forth. Again, you don't have enough time to get into the details of it, 
So I'll give you a couple of examples here. This is the customer report card. When you first start, what we need to do is for that industry, for that business, ask our customer what's important and how is the company performing in that area. And specifically how you compare, how you actually doing compared to your competition. Because if everybody's doing it in 12 days, then there's no issue. But if somebody's doing 12 days, somebody's doing 25 days, then there's an issue. So you want the customer to tell you how you're performing in this area. So if you're getting an F here, because how long it takes to do something is really long, then you better try to figure out how to improve that. This is the example that's filled out. This is an example of a processing of individual and family insurance policy. The typical insurance company gets an application in, needs to process, and give you a policy. So you can see here, the process box, fill out the app, access the center, receive, sort, and log, process the application, make an underwriting decision. Big process boxes, right? Collection of the data, process time 20 minutes, lead time one day, completion and accuracy 55%, 10 apps per job. Cycle time, one day. Then goes into the receive and sort, process time 30 seconds, processing application seven minutes, underwriting between 10 to 50 minutes. This whole process is somewhere between 60 to 80 minutes total from the time that you receive the request. Right now it's taking over 11 days. Just an example. So the conversation becomes, what's causing this? Yes. Why does the like this? I'm sorry, right, one more time. Why does the school up and down? Oh, actually, this is just showing you the, the, the duration. This is the, this is the cycle time between this process and this process. So this is the output from this process is input for this. And this is down here showing you how long this is taking versus how long this is taking versus how long this is taking. It's just showing you the cycle time between each process. So the, process, the processing gets done in X number of days. Then it waits in the queue, then it gets processed, and waits in the queue, it gets processed on. This is an example, of course. Is it getting warm in here, or am I the only one? Or, or is that a okay? patient? Some people will keep cold. Oh, that's fine, I'm fine. I'm just trying to make sure people are not warm. Just a check. Are you comfortable? Go up or down? Okay, great. Is this on target? There's just a checkpoint here. And is this information useful to you? So far, so good? Okay, good. Uh, so this is, again, an example, just to give you a flavor for the concept. And here, we're actually going to go ahead and give you another example that is simpler. This is about recruiting. I will go find somebody to join me, join my company. So it starts with identifying the need for that resource, finding and selecting that candidate, negotiating an agreement on onboarding. Four boxes. But it turns out all of this from a processing point of view, it takes about 23 hours. But how long it takes to get somebody on board is over 1,300 hours <laughs> from a time that somebody said one on So lots of non-value-added activities between the time that somebody said one somebody to the time that I, that I brought them on board and on board the individual. This is called the activity ratio. This kind of highlights the difference between actual processing time and what it takes for you to get things done. And you can see here, processing time and lead time examples, what it takes to actually do this thing called identify need, and how long it actually takes it for it to take from, go from here to here. Just an example here, right? Percent complete and accurate, as far as data is needed, all the way to delivery of all of those capabilities. So I'm gonna take you to the next page here. Here, we've actually now started to say, well, who's involved in this process? Is the hiring manager? Is the recruiter, maybe? There's a candidate, there's three systems, ZipRecruiter, an access database, and Workday. These are the systems and the people involved in the process. And so we start a mapping process. Okay, first step is, what is the recruiting strategy? And that actually allows us to assign a position ID in Workday so that the system knows that we are looking for a new position to be created. Then the HR recruiter posts the job, puts it also into the uh, 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 zip recruiter system to analyze the position better, then post the open position, log the position, you get the picture. This is the process. And what you want to be able to do is to look at how this is done in your organization 
to see why it's taking 200 days to get somebody on board. And there are many external dependencies. Absolutely, and, and, and if there are external dependencies, we want to add them here. This is the mapping process. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to add a, a comment, if I may. Uh, a lot of times, uh, one of the biggest uh, type of waste in, in, in an organization is wait time, and that's why you know, processing time is really short. Exactly. Everybody is moving very efficiently. We can have a lot of wait time, and so in the lead time, you want to spend. And nobody is in charge of wait time, right? So exactly. it goes invisible. Uh, and, or nobody is responsible for process. <laughs> that's the issue. And exactly, wait. And when you say non value added time, is exactly that wait. Do I really need to wait three days for this? Many times, no. It just happens to be because I have somebody has to take the file and move it from here to here, and it takes the bus you know, two days to get here before it's moved to this location. You just lost three days. And every Simple process. stuff. And every process is not critical, right? Exactly. We're just using this as an example of how to analyze because organizations don't think in terms of process. But these are the biggest cost drivers. These are the biggest opportunities to understand where the value add of any technology could be. That's the topic that we want to be able to focus the organization on. Once we've done that analysis and understood how to take it from 25 days down to 10, because we removed all this non value added stuff. Fix the system issues that was causing all of this. Hire, hire the bad contractor, put somebody good, all of that stuff. Then you're going to have to have the ten. You're going to have the ten day cycle time uh, in this case. This is an example of a transformation plan that says these are the ten or twelve things that I'm going to actually do. Everything from hiring somebody, training somebody, changing a process, hiring a contractor, whatever it is you decide to do, is listed here, including. Playing around with blockchain, having artificial intelligence, running an experiment, whatever they are, is listed with owners and the specific timelines and where you are in delivering that particular project. So this is how we actually create that real plan that says I can fix this distribution problem from here to here and take it from 25 down to 12 days if I were to do these 10. Yes, sir. Uh, I wonder how many project managers we have here. And does it does this is the chart show anything close to work with our structure? <laughs> <laughs> it, it may look like it, but it's actually not a work with because what because what it's doing is these are independent things. And and specifically, well then each one of these they may be even agile projects. That don't have the per charge and the appropriate time and structures and all that. Instead, they have the program increment and the backlog and the implementation plan. And it's a critical part. Okay. And it's what? It's a critical part. Yes. So, this is what the output is from that analysis. So, we now understand the value stream, basically, and how it's actually going to be improved based on our report. Another concept that you'll hear about is why is it agile the only way used to do things? I used to do things with traditional methods and waterfall for 20 plus years. Why does everything have to be agile now? Well, not everything has to be agile now. The key is picking up or matching the right project or the right methodology. It turns out if you have a pretty good understanding of what you're going to deliver, if you've done it before and you know what it takes to deliver it, Actually, traditional methods are great. They're the best way to do it. You could actually run it in a traditional way, define the Gantt chart, define the budget, uh, and keep to the deliverables. And there's benefits of to doing that for certain kind of projects. The problem is that most of our projects are now in this other side of things where requirements are less known or not definable. And the technology complexity has increased. It's no longer simple. And when that happens, you will start to find that there's a much better match in agile approaches than there is for traditional approaches. And that's the difference. You'll find less and less projects that can easily be solved with the traditional approaches. You need to have more versatility, you need to have more reaction time, you need to be able to expect and react to changes throughout the life of the This is called the safety matrix that shows that. And of course, at this level, where there's no agreement on what the requirements are and complexity is so high, you're just going to have anarchy. Okay. 
and there is no good way to deal with that. So here, we talk about the steps to address uncertainties in digital transformation. So several suggestions here. Articulating clearly what needs to be built to support transformation. Specifically, we need to know who the customer is and what is the value proposition. So segment the customer. Who am I doing this for? Is it for every driver that, that exists in Uber, or is it for drivers of this sex, this age, and this kind of profession? Do I understand this customer segment I'm doing this for, and what is the specific value proposition? Am I mapping properly the journey of that driver's experience or the rider's experience? Those are key to achieving success. Being able to continuously engage and listen to the customer, both understanding things from a vertical point of view to how to deliver value as well as horizontally. Being able to have deliverable chunks of functionality and getting feedback continuously. Uh, also, we want to be able to take that feedback and incorporate it into this project and into the experiment. Now, we also want to be able to continuously and systematically experiment and apply new technologies. Again, architectural spikes and new ways of determining whether an idea can work, new ideas, new UXs, new experiences, and also having rapid deployment of new functionality into production. Those are some good practices that we should consider. This is, for those of you who are familiar with SAFE, as I mentioned, Scale Agile Framework and Methodology, this is the actual roadmap of how organizations usually start with SAFE. So there's more heat coming down the pipe. Yeah. Is that yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. A lot of either uh, shivering, either shivering or, or no air. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's everything. Okay, great. So should I just use Uber on my phone? We don't have the, the, the door stop. Right? Oh, okay. I can put this in front of it. You okay with it? Yeah. I don't think that's just hold on. There is my picture. That should not hold. Okay, there's no hold. Okay. No, no, no that should not hold. I've tried. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So, let's see. Uh, let me also do another checkpoint here. So we're about 7.50. So I have 10 more minutes. <laughs> what part of the discussion would you like to delve deeper into this? What I have left here is a lot of detail about state and agile, scaled agile methodologies that I'll share with you, but the framework and why it works and how it works and all that. Is that a good topic to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes on? Yes? Okay, good. And just, just a comment, we're going to have uh, an access to, uh, to the PowerPoint presentation, to, to his presentation. Now you can download it and uh, study it in more detail. Yep. Yep. And of course, you call me nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Email, please. <laughs> uh, I'll respond at 12 minutes. Uh, so as you can imagine, I'm on the roll of <laughs> Email is probably the easiest way to get hold of me. Uh, so this is the process by which we actually uh, start this whole journey of bringing scale agile to organization. We've talked about the challenge before. Basically, every organization has these little agile teams that are doing great stuff, but there's only five, ten people in it, and nobody else can replicate it, nor can they scale it. So there are several methodologies, including the Scaled Agile Framework, SAFE, that tries to deal with that uh, issue. And what it does, really, it takes the basic interactions and ceremonies that you do for a small team, and how you actually develop software and deliver it at high frequency, and just scales it to multiple teams. And then there's enough coordination between those teams to be able to get to a larger initiative that is well planned and well delivered. That's the basic concept. So what do you do to start this process? Usually it starts with value stream definitions. Understanding if you have an organization of 2,000 IT people or five different business units, from finance to marketing to logistics, every one of those organizations have different needs. Every one of those organizations have different value streams. So usually we want to start with defining what those operational value streams are. Now what I shared with you is analyzing in detail what you can do to improve them. In SAFE, the way to use primarily is just to organize our right? So if you're going to have 10 teams, knowing which team should be together and put into the same train, what's called an agile release train arc, is how you actually start the process. Deciding what value streams are best put together so that the teams can be all a part of the same train. Okay. So we start with the operational value stream definition. 
Then we decide which systems actually support those value streams that have to be a part of this. Then we talk about the people who are going to be supporting those systems. And then eventually here, the development value streams that will have to be used to build those systems. And of course, organizing them into agile release training. So when you're talking about the scale of methodologies, all that is is taking the ceremonies that work really well at small scale, how we do an incremental or an iteration plan, how we do retrospectives, how we do scrums to, to be able to understand how to improve things. All of those concepts then would need to be taken to the higher scale. And this is what's going to help us do that. These are a couple of examples. There's two kinds of value streams we talk about usually, either operational, which is about how you deliver your service, whatever you do as a business, the processes that deliver the end result to the customer is called the operational value streams. The processes that support the organization, like HR or finance and all that, are referred to as support value streams. And then finally, you have the development value stream how exactly you organize your resources to develop the systems or enhance the systems to deliver to certain clients. So in this case, it happens to be employee recruiting. The top one happens to be hospital patient services from the time that they arrive at the hospital to the time that they leave and they pay their bill. Consumer bank loan, from the time that you attract a customer to get a loan from you, to giving them the rates on the, uh, on the loan, all the way to the award of a loan, and then closing the loan and starting the repayment process. That's called an operational value stream. Okay? So if you have a bank, you may have a commercial bank, you may have a retail bank, you may have a mortgage bank, so on and so forth. Each one is going to have its own value streams. That if you're doing something for the client or for your organization, you want to make sure you understand which part are you focused on. And each one of these value streams is going to have probably multiple systems. Or for you to understand the value stream, you need to be able to document it. This is an example of how you document the development value stream. We call it the development value stream canvas. And specifically, it has a vision statement, who the stakeholders are, who the customer segment is, what solution it's focused on, people and locations, channels, economic framework that you use, and key performance indicators. You want to be able to have a quick one-pager about each one of those value streams. Examples of definitions, this is an example of a consumer loan, okay. providing consumers with unsecured or secured loans. The customers are the existing retail customers, the triggers are that they want to borrow some money to the bank. Value received is repayment plus interest, and of course it includes all the channels, the loan systems, credit scoring, for banking, so on and so forth. So that's how you can actually put on one page the definition of that value stream. And depending on who you are, the question that you would ask to be able to say, what are the value streams that I need to think about? So if you are an independent software vendor, it's really about the products you have. Whatever, if you're Adobe and you create Illustrator, your value is the software that produces uh, the, the graphic artist capabilities. So every system or product could be a value stream, as an example. If you're a large uh, multinational uh, organization, you may ask about key business processes, internal departments that you support, what internal external customers are supported by you, so on and so forth. So depending on what kind of company you are, what you do for a living, you would ask the kind of questions to define the value stream. This is an example of actually managing and reporting on adoption of uh, scaled agile framework for organizations. These are just examples, I won't get into it. But being able to automatically capture some of this, if you're doing this at a scale of 2,000 people that all have to learn and sort of produce and forecast their velocity and produce uh, outcomes, you want to be able to have ways to collect this data. And there's software out there that helps facilitate the collection and reporting of that data. The scaling Agile actually allows you, or a scaled Agile for digital transformation allows you to organize and align all of your resources so that they're all headed in the same direction. Imagine having 50 different teams who are not coordinated and trying to produce something that has value. Almost impossible for many organizations. You want to have a methodology that defines the relationship and the interdependencies and the interaction and ceremonies that are needed at all levels. So it's from master at a team, all the way to a release train engineer, all the way to a portfolio manager. 
those ceremonies have to be defined and executed properly. So this helps us to align the team through self-empowerment and adopting the manifesto values and principles, to scale the multiple teams to be able to take over and execute a large-scale transformation, estimating accurately and incrementally for large program increments, being able to deliver valuable chunks quickly. This is one of the biggest advantages of Agile methodology. It produces value, working software, theoretically every two to three weeks. You may not deliver into production, but the idea is that every time you do something, it's producing the value. And that's the key difference between Agile methods and traditional methods that have life cycles that don't produce and deliver anything until the very end. And finally, being able to uh, improve success uh, uh, dramatically by continuing to embrace some of the key values and principles that make it all work, basically. And I'll share with you some of those principles in a second. This is examples of the actual methodology. This is called the CL title framework, as I mentioned before. It has several different layers. This is the essential layer. So at the essential layer, you're organizing yourself to have some key concepts already in place for your teams, the ideas of team and program. So the idea is that there's multiple teams as a part of a program. That's the essential level. At this level, there's going to be basic planning going on for your program increment. These program increments typically is two to three weeks, and there's usually five increments within a uh, five iteration, excuse me, within the program increments. At the end of each program increment, you basically do retrospectives and plan your next increments. And this goes on and on. Again, all part of an agile release train that delivers against the value stream that you have in mind. So this is called the essential, the basic components. There's DevOps that supports all of this. And of course, all the disciplines that go along with this, the concepts of XP or Extreme Programming and Scrum being part of the methodology here and Kanban. And the key resources that usually are involved are a Scrum Master, Product Owner, and a Development. Basic roles in the team. This is the full framework. So you have the same team and same program at this level. But if you're dealing with a larger organization and larger projects, then there's additional layers of coordination that comes into play at the solution or large solution level and the portfolio level. So at this level, you actually have enterprise architects involved in all of your initiatives. There is direction that is set for the kind of system you're building. And then there is the budgeting process that supports all of this along with a lean portfolio management team. So again, all of this coordination is scaled up to a higher level and eventually to the enterprise. And behind each one of these ideas, there's actually hyperlinks that you can go and say, what does an architect do? What does a team do? What does a scrum master do? Or what is this concept all about? And you can actually see all of this online. It's all free. It's just a methodology that you can tap into. So some of the key success practices that we want to consider, extreme programming practices tends out to be a common thread across many Agile methodologies. Some of those practices are useful to many different approaches, all Agile methods. The skill sets, you want to go for T-shaped skills, and I'll describe what that is. Team structures that are long-lived and high-performance teams. Changing reward mechanisms, so people are incentivized to stay with their team and grow, and in essence produce to be a self-empowered team to deliver value. And finally, coaching and mentoring that is needed to make it all happen. Starting with extreme programming, at the highest level, it's about shared understanding and fine-grained feedback that is part of this process, including pairing of programs, programmers, excuse me, and the collective ownership for the code that is being built. Whole team being involved in the planning and execution, simple design, architecture, and user experience, building quality in through test-driven development, and sustainable case. These methodologies are a core part of SAFE as well. XP and Scrum are the core foundation for how SAFE actually advocates adoption of Agile. <clears throat> T scale, T shaped skills mean that you want everybody on the team to have broad set of skills and can pitch in at any point in time. So if the developer is gone, the tester should be able to develop. If the tester is gone, the analyst should be able to step in and do something. So on and so forth. The idea is that everybody has broad skills and can, can work on many aspects of the project but everybody also has deep skill sets. So I'm a very uh, skilled agile, sorry, Java developer, right? So I have very deep skills here, so I work on the most difficult challenges as part of the team, but I can also 
Pinchen and by Nietzsche for testing or for scrum mastery by Nietzsche. That's the basic idea of a T-shaped uh, skill set, basically. All right, uh, so what kind of resources do you need for these implementation? So everything from coaches for leading agile, value stream and process mapping experts, release train engineers, scrum masters, DevOps engineers, user experience designers and architects, uh, system architects, enterprise architects, security architects, cloud architects, and integration architects. These are the kind of resources, depending on the project, depending on what scale you're working on, that may need to contribute, depending on where you are in the life cycle. And finally, in terms of the digital, digital transformation approach, as you can see, lean management started with the Toyota way in the 80s and 90s. Agile development really started in the early 2000s with the uh, principles and uh, the manifesto. And it's now evolved to the concepts that are, you are more best represented by the lean startups. Lean startup concepts about building, measuring, experiment. Those ideas, in essence, almost always rely upon the core agile discipline and the key values. And that's where we're headed. More and more organizations need to be able to adopt and successfully deploy these new methods. In the appendix, I've left for you several things that uh, Raj asked about early on. Uh, Lean really has four fundamental foundations. Respect for people and culture, optimizing flow, enabling innovation, and relentless improvement. Improving is the part that's been built into the whole process. Leadership has to lead it, and the focus is all about creating value. It's not about plans, it's not about how we actually do things three years from now. It's how to optimize value in the next two to three weeks and continuously deliver our value. Every decision is about what is the value of this to the business. Always prioritizing, always optimizing on delivering value to the customer. The key items of the manifesto are we prefer, as agile developers, individuals and interactions for processes and tools. We don't want to say, oh, process that this. We want to say what's going to work. How do I do this better? It's all about individuals together deciding how to do something better over the relying on process and tools. Delivering working software rather than comprehensive documentation. Just enough documentation. And that is the logic. Never go overboard. It's just enough to be able to deliver the value to the client. Customer collaboration. Customer is a part of the team. A product owner or representative of the customer lives with you every day, eight hours a day. They're a part of the two-week plan. They're the ones who sits with you and explains everything, the demo of the system to the actual end user or the vice president. It's all about customer collaboration. And of course, being able to respond to change over following the plan. It's perfectly okay if you decide to change everything that we're going to do in the next program increment because we're able to adopt and adapt change. A little bit about the lean principles that are part of the safe methodology. Uh, well, these are you know, discussions that take hours of basic core nine set of values. Uh, and finally, this has been proven. In many, many use cases, many, many case studies, you could go to the website and you can read detailed adoption scenarios from multiple industries. Typical scenarios are 30 to 75 percent faster time to market, 25 to 75 percent defect reductions. Happier, more motivated uh, employees, and increases in productivity. This is proven over and over and over again. A couple more slides comparing agile to waterfall in terms of commitment and delivery, decision and adaptability, uh, tracking progress. I won't read them to you, but this is just reference for you so you can see the difference. So if somebody says, Why should I? I'm also different. You have a quick reference guide. And finally, one of the key concepts that I want to leave you with is that incremental delivery is always going to give you some value a lot earlier in time. And having that value a lot earlier in time gives you a huge advantage compared to waiting 18 months or two years to deliver or to receive this. For many projects that do take this long, what happens unfortunately when you get to here, the whole thing gets canceled. Business change, drivers change, competition change, something changed and I gotta cancel you. So with this kind of agile methodology, you've actually built something that you can take advantage of. With this approach, the whole thing is thrown away. Nothing has been delivered. That's the key difference. Waterfall, safe, less Spotify nexus, other examples that Roy asked for, 
and hybrid methodologies. The key is, do we understand the principles and can we apply those principles to your environment to create digital value and different kind of value at a much more rapid pace for your environment? That is Lots of challenges that go along with this. It is very much different than the traditional methods. It is not about top down, it's more about bottoms up, it's more about empowerment, it's more about self uh, realization. <laughs> and that's a huge change for many, many organizations. So even though companies say, I've adopted Agile and I want to become this or that, they really don't understand it until the top level managers understand how to enable and stop asking with that per chart and budget and that are all the things that they typically see from the old projects. They try to replicate and duplicate for Agile. It doesn't work. These are fundamentally different approaches. So management and leadership has to understand the difference but support the kind of change that's needed. That's a little bit about what we do at, say, at Agile and IT, and that's it. Uh, so I know that we have went over a little bit here. Uh, questions uh, that we should touch on. What, what topic in, uh, was interesting to you from what you heard? Oh God, everything. Because <laughs> <laughs> being at a, a, a practice, yeah, my practice and my, my coaching in Agile, uh, the more you talk about your uh, your life experience and you have a few examples, uh, makes me think on how we can uh, adjust to different uh, different settings. Yeah. And it is just about having that mindset that we can go and apply the principle to the actual real life meet and there is no one set of rules. Of course, when we talk about the uh, trial, we talk about transition of that. Look, no and uh, you know Boeing has been sending out the satellites for the past forty plus years. And they've been doing mostly in mostly in traditional waterfall way. So building, uh, you know, creating, building real uh, high rises needs to go to traditional waterfall, waterfall way. This is good, it's working. But even at, at a company like Boeing, they're introducing agile whenever it is possible, at any single interim process that they can do. Good point. And it's really, it really comes down to understanding the core values and principles and applying it. If, 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 if you have that in mind, the methodology is secondary, but of course you want to have the tools and the methods guide you, but it's really applying the values and principles, understanding why they're different and how they add value differently than traditional methods, and being able to choose the right methods for the right occasion. So it is easy. Uh, I, I promised you a little bit of an email response, so if there's anything in here you want to hear me hear from me about, info at agile.it, will get to me, they'll route it to me. Uh, and of course, when you download this, you have this. My phone number is on there as well, but I'm less available on phone because of traveling and client sessions on a lot of days. Uh, but I'm happy to answer a question or a challenge that you run into or a question that you want to talk about, I'm happy to work with you. Uh, so with that, uh, this is the formal part of this, so I'll thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. No. Yeah. Thank you. We, we keep it there. All right. Uh, a couple of, uh, couple of... Oh, that's fine. Right. You can connect with me if you, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 just, I'll give you my name. If you just look me up, I think LinkedIn just pop me right up. Yes. Yeah.